I'm Luke Gerges. And I'm Poppy Reed. And welcome to the Music Network Podcast. Our guest is someone whose story has captivated millions, a narrative filled with ambition, crime, marketing brilliance, and absolute stupidity. Today, we delve into the mind of Billy McFarlane, the entrepreneur behind the infamous Firefest. He's recently been released from prison after serving four years of a six-year sentence and is currently planning Firefest 2. Since we booked this podcast, we've been traveling through America, meeting many people in the music and entertainment industry, and I've asked everyone about Billy McFarland. Each conversation about Billy seems to take the same arc. The person I'm speaking to can't believe how stupid he was. Sometimes they'll call him a crook or a fraud star. And then we start talking about Firefest 2 and how unbelievable it is that he's attempting to do it again. However, regardless of how long or how negative the conversation seems to go, it always seems to conclude the same way. We hope that Billy succeeds at Firefest 2, however unlikely that is, and that Billy can turn his life around and repay all the debts from the, the first festival. Billy McFarlane, welcome to the Music Network Podcast. I am blown away by your intro. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It's a goodie, right? Yeah, I know. I've done a bunch of these recently, and no one's opened it up like that, so excited. Well, let's start with that, actually. So you're doing a whole bunch of press right now. You're doing a whole bunch of podcasts. You've been doing them for a while, but even today, you've got a bunch on. Which experience has been your favorite? Which podcast? Yeah, which let's go to podcast. Which podcast has been your favorite? I think uh, Stephen Bartlett from the Diary of the CEO has just been one of the most impressive podcasters I've met. He's total savage in like the best way, extremely smart. You like a savage? Okay. Yeah, I uh, didn't listen to the show before I did the episode. I showed up hungover, not knowing what to expect, and like really kind of drilled into your like psychoanalysis and everything about me. So I wasn't really sure what to expect for that one. But I think that uh, actually turned a lot of people into supporters in a really weird way. So that was awesome. And and sorry, explain that. How, how did it turn people into supporters? I think the conversation like, just like wasn't what I was expecting. So it got raw and it got deep and it got there very quickly. And I think people who heard that conversation for you know the hour and a half or two hours that it was um, just helped support the brand. So yeah, if we can you know find... 20 or 25 core fire supporters from every podcast. I think it's a huge win for us. How are you defining a supporter? Uh, someone willing to come to fire two with limited information to be there and be part of the cultural moment, not knowing what's going to happen. And like we were joking that I think the guests for fire two are going to be far more interesting than people that come to fire three. Cause like once it works, everybody knows it's great. Like that's whatever. But I think the people who want to take that risk are the ones who are, uh, are very unique. Let's go into taking that risk yeah. as well, because I understand why Firefest 2 needs to happen in your mm -hmm. world. You know, it's going to positively impact your reputation. You're going to be able to pay back the vendors and investors mm -hmm. as well. We're also going to see the initial vision that you had for yeah. Firefest, of course. But what drives that passion to then go into rooms, into investment rooms mm -hmm. and pitch Firefest 2 again? So paying everybody back is like the most important thing for me. I think I violated the trust of people who supported me for four or five years prior to fire ever existing. So if I can go and shake their hands in two years and like, hey, I did it like that, that's really, really empowering for me. But two, I think the idea of fire too, just like is still there. People want to escape reality for three days. They want to meet three or four other thousand interesting people and just like have an adventurous weekend. So I think the demand for fire almost has increased like since COVID and, and I think since the interest in a traditional, you know, stage with hundred thousand people staring at that one stage, that's kind of dwindled. Mm -hmm. And I think people are more interested in experiences and adventure and like what happens when you do these things with other people. What do you think drives that belief that people are going to give you their money again though? Yeah. Uh, we did a pre-sale last August with no information and like a bad selfie video and that sold out in a day. So I think the demand is there. Um, yeah, we have a really funny marketing approach for, for Fire 2. I think a total 180 in the first one, definitely more like parody, more self-deprecation, but still kind of showing the adventure of a Fire Festival. So excited to roll it out. And who's on your team? Is there any people from Firefest 1 that's involved in Firefest 2? I got to interview Andy King in okay. 2019. He came to Australia to speak at Big Sound. Oh, nice. Amazing person. Yeah, he's great. Um, is he involved? Uh, Andy's helping out for sure. Um, well, he'll... We haven't figured out what that means yet, but I'm sure he'll be there in some capacity. We have a couple of the original people, but the difference this time is that there is like a controlling partner who is a festival operating company who's actually in charge. So they'll let me do my like a crazy, you know, plane rides, lobster dives, marketing stuff, but they'll actually run the show and make sure your tent is uh, is going to stand up in the storm. <laughs> <laughs> and who is that controlling partner? Like who? They're, who they're the a festival company it? who just does festivals full time and they'll be making an announcement in the spring. So you're not allowed to name them not yet? Not allowed to name them yet, no. Why? 
uh, I don't know. I'm under an NDA, so it's 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 up to them to make their own announcement. I guess. I'm Are they the waiting guy. for ticket sales to be? No, they're when or... they announce themselves, they'll announce the final date, uh, the final location. They'll put tickets on sale alongside that announcement. Is it a public company? Uh, no, I don't believe so. No. Okay. And how big's the team behind Firefest too? Uh, it's pretty big. Um, people wise, I'm not sure, but there's like an overall festival company. There's a talent partner, and then I kind of have like my internal, you know, fire marketing team, which is much smaller than it was before. But yeah, I guess big ambitions and a lot of interest, and we yeah, we're we're targeting the winter of next year. Does this mean you're taking the role as a CMO with Firefest too? I guess probably like creative director CMO is a better way to describe it. Um, yeah, if you see me trying to install bathrooms like last time, it's probably not going not gonna to work out well. So, yeah, letting the experts do what they're great at instead of trying to figure that out myself and yeah, getting help, but doubling down on what I am good at. Mm. I, I would love for you to take us into the room where you had that first initial pitch meeting with an investor yeah. for Firefest 2. Mm-hmm. What happens? How did you, was it just you? Who, who, who did you have with you? Take us into the room. So I, I knew a couple of the larger festival companies from six or seven years ago who we did not work with. So the first conversations were with them, like, hey, do you guys want to take this over? And ended up meeting a group serendipitously through the process who kind of gave a pitch as to why they'd be the best people to execute Fire 2 and you know, luckily signed with them. But it's been a very like black and white experience. People are either like, fuck off, like get out of my office. How dare you think you can come here? Or like, we love this, like, no need to explain anything, we're on board. There's been nothing in the middle. So yeah, I think I'm attracting like people who are very on the opposite end of the spectrum. I also think the tell would be whether they take the meeting or not. I for, mean, for sure. some might take it just out of curiosity, mm-hmm. but I think that people aren't really interested in wasting their time. So if for they're sure. taking the meeting, they're, they're interested, I guess. I think a question there that I get all the time is like, do you get a lot of hate in the streets of New York? And the answer is no. I think it's for that very same reason. People who like hate me, they're so caught up in their own problems and their own bullshit, right? They don't have time to like go and talk shit. So yeah, I think it's probably the same thing for the meetings. Like mm. those who are like are hating don't have time to deal with it. And then another one of the big questions that's hanging over Firefest too is how you're booking bands. Yeah. Uh, are you having to pay them 100% deposits mm-hmm. at this point? How is that working? Uh, so the partners booking the artists, I've obviously been on some of those calls. We've, you know, working on the first couple of headliners. And I think ultimately, in the past six or seven years, the music business has changed a little bit, whereas it's an attention game now. So I'm sure there are a number of artists who will say absolutely no to Fire 2, but I think there are a large number of artists who realize that it, once they come out and say, like, you know, we are headlining Fire 2, the attention, the press, the media they'll get is going to be very valuable for them. And they are being offered 100% deposits? Uh, I don't think so, no. But not up to me, but I don't ah, think so. Yeah. I know you did a yeah. podcast chat with uh, Tosh. So just like everybody was paid, all the bands are paid a lot for the first Fire Festival. So we do have that, have that proof point going for us. I think that was yeah. that was glossed over in the coverage. But yeah, there you go. all the artists were paid. Yeah, and I, I heard you wanted Kanye there. Uh, that would be fun. What do you guys think? I would like to see it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Kanye is so divisive for me. I yeah. don't think I know enough to even speak on it, but I would absolutely love to write about that as a journalist. Mm-hmm. So you think it's like a big brand moment? Huge brand moment. Yeah. I fucking love Kanye. Yeah. I mean, he, to me, Kanye, Kanye is one of the greatest artists who have ever lived and he has done some fucking moron shit. Yeah. But I fucking love him. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and I and I think that's kind of on brand with Fire Festival. Yeah. It's like you you're obviously a marketing genius. Mm-hmm. Like there's there's no doubt about that, but you've obviously done some fucking dumb shit. For sure. And so it's like let's It's a perfect Let's fit. bring them together. <laughs> So I think what's crazy yeah. is, like, <laughs> I agree. I'm like, that just creates, that's one plus one is way more than two in that situation. But she, Wait, can I ask, Kanye has been very open about his mental health struggles. Okay. Do you have uh, any mental health struggles in the same way that he does? Uh, I think that would be a bad excuse. I think, yeah. you know, my bad moments were just like, you know, lying to investors to raise the money. So I don't think I can use mental health as an excuse. But yeah, I mean... Huge fan of Kanye's music, but I think what's really interesting is, you know, have tried to pitch that concept to various people we're working with. Um, and they're like more scared of Kanye than working with me. I'm like, how is this possible, guys? Like, <laughs> I went to jail for doing something wrong and you're willing to work with me, but not him. And like some of them are, some of them aren't. And uh, maybe Jeez. it's something we can work out, but maybe not. But yeah, I, th- I thought that was interesting. Have conversations with Kanye's team happened? Uh, I don't know. I can't, can't comment on that. 
You don't know or you can't comment. Okay, okay, okay. So we, <laughs> so we, so we <laughs> that's out of my territory. <laughs> we recently got bought by a public company, our media business. Oh, cool! Congrats. And it. one of the um, one of the first things that I learn about being part of a public company is when something is being worked on or likely yeah. to happen and you can't actually say mm-hmm. you confirm that you've got to say i can't comment on that got it that's what you say so there that's you what go. you just did to us got my mouthpiece right boys so <laughs> kanye west is definitely playing five <laughs> that's, that's, you heard it, you heard it I, i'd say that <laughs> no, can't comment. do you have a ceo like who's your person running five s2 yes yeah, right so the operating partner is in charge it's like a 51 49 percent kind of arrangement so where well, you have 49 uh, yeah correct so they and they're putting they up say, all the money. Yeah, they're in charge of the financing, budget, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I can't touch that, unfortunately. Okay. No. Last drill down, you know, one word answer, yeah. Fire Fest 2 yeah. question. Yeah. When is the event happening? Because I've seen mm-hmm. December this year and mm-hmm. then I have seen winter of 2025. Yeah. When so are we're, we are targeting early next year. So like winter 2025. Gotcha. Uh, date and location will be announced shortly. We have offers from a few different Caribbean locations and... I kind of have my favorite, so we'll hopefully hopefully announce it soon. We'll pick it soon. So I think one of the biggest challenges you're going to face is building trust, obviously, yep. right? And hasn't the date moved a lot? So it wasn't it like November and then it got pushed back to March and now? Am I getting that no, right? No, we never announced it. We did like a window. We said like between December and March. So we said between December 24 and March 25. Okay. And I always said like date to be announced soon. That's what you yeah. were talking about when you said there's a lot of blind faith. Like the the, yeah. the characters that are going to come to Fire Fest. But that makes it interesting, right? blind faith <laughs> because you've been very clear that it ticket prices <laughs> range from three and a half grand to one million yeah, plus. Yeah, having fun with it. <laughs> and, um, and that it might, the, the date is something subject to change so you, three three thousand dollars to one million plus to your price yeah. ranges the pre-sales were what at what price point so we did a 500 hundred dollar pre-sale for like the 100 tickets like the first thing last august and those went really fast okay and then did like a 2500 hundred dollar pre-sale and then the main ticket price will start around 3500 and go all the way up to a million plus but we've had 110 people apply for the million dollar ticket which i think is fucking insane 110 yeah. people apply yeah. Who are these people? Would they like to invest in the Bragg Media? <laughs> <laughs> Don't steal my customers. <laughs> I'm just Why not have both? I'm, I'm just kidding. Okay, okay so... But yeah, we did like a joke saying if you have to ask who the lineup is before spending a million dollars, don't come to fire. I'm like... That oh my worked. God, it's like that laundry thing. That worked thing. really well. If you, yeah. ask, if you have to ask, you can't afford. <laughs> exactly. I love it. Okay, so you owe how much? 25 million, 26? Uh, I think it's 26. Okay, and if... Um, Firefest sells out at all the price points you're yep. you're putting. How much money will you personally take home? Ooh, really good question. Uh, I don't know. You, your guess will be better than mine, so have a go. I think that if fire goes as planned in five to seven years, that I'll be paying off my restitution in full. Okay, so, so you'll yeah, need. Take, so it's, it's a multi-year. Yeah, I plan. think it takes five to seven years to pay back that twenty-six million dollars. If every year is a hundred percent success, or moderately successful, or what? But one hundred percent success. Okay, um, but so the, the bar is low, though, right? Like one hundred percent success <laughs> right now is just <laughs> is doing, is doing it well. Okay, so five years. So you're probably gonna take home what six, seven million dollars a year, if if it's super successful. We'll see. So okay, y- and how much of that? So does that mean 100% of the your earnings from this festival is going back to paying off that debt? So a percentage of all my income, like no matter what, whether it's a, for a marketing job, for a TV show, for a fire two, that goes back to restitution every month. Mm-hmm. Then in addition to that, we are giving a percentage of the fire business back to restitution as well. So like no matter what the business makes, they'll be paying something to, to back to restitution. And whatever I earn, a percentage of that goes back to restitution too. Okay, so... Is that is that percentage a fixed number? Uh, I think it varies based on income level and like you know there's taxes blah blah. Yeah. So it's like yeah, it's semi complicated. So if it's ten percent, mm-hmm. I don't know if you, it doesn't sound like you can confirm mm-hmm. the number, but let's mm-hmm. say it's ten percent. You make a thousand dollars this week, a hundred dollars of that goes back to restitution. Sure. Yeah. And so exactly. Okay. So if you earn say so does the does the percent is there a cap on that percentage? Does it you know if you earn ten million dollars one month, do, does that percentage go up to ninety percent or? Like, how does that swing and how is that calculated? I, I believe, like, I'm still fairly early on to this process and mm. unfortunately haven't earned, like, $100 million in the past mm. 16 months, but I believe it does sway. Um, and also, we are paying, I'm paying more, too. Like, so the fire company will pay X percent off the top back to restitution, and then whatever my share is, I pay it again. So basically, I pay twice there. So, yeah, it's definitely onerous. Okay. And what is the break even how many tickets do you need to sell how much money is break even for five yeah so approximately four thousand attendees okay yeah and what's the capacity uh four thousand 
So wait, 4,000 is break even? No, 4,000 attendees like total. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not the finance guy, so uh, I'm not in charge of the budget of the accounting, so I have no idea like what the break even number is. But okay. you know, we fully expect that we will sell out our 4,000 tickets like very quickly after the announcement. Okay, cool. So again, I, I mentioned in the intro that we every conversation I'm having about you in America mm-hmm. is it always concludes with we hope you succeed. Mm-hmm. I think the whole music entertainment industry, the more successful people there are in general, this has nothing to do with you even, the more successful people are in general, the better it is for everybody. Yeah. Um, so, but but then there's the added story to you is if you succeed, everyone, you know, everyone gets paid back, mm-hmm. which is also like working in your favor. Super cool, yeah. Right? So you've got a lot of people like despite what people might think of you or how they feel about their personal experience with Firefest One, Everyone, there, there's I don't I've met anybody who's rooting for your demise, mm-hmm. and there might have been people might have been rooting for your demise at the first time for sure. Because when people have big swings, you know, there's there's I feel like everyone that doesn't have a big swing wants the person to fail yeah. so they don't feel worse about themselves. So you had everybody kind of a lot of people rooting for your demise in the first festival. It fucked up, royal like couldn't have gone worse, and now everyone's kind of rooting for your success, which is a weird kind of. It is weird, right? It doesn't make sense, yeah. right? But that's that's what's happening. And so... We love a comeback story. Well, yeah. But I... Uh, anyway. We love an underdog. I don't know if the word's ironic. I don't know if that... I'm not the journalist. I mean, you're better with what words than I What does that feel like? It's yeah. kind of ironic. Is it? Yeah. Is I, that the right word? I always like... it. It, But it plays in so many aspects of life, too. I think when I was at my most successful point in life, I was always trying to, like, you know, prove that, you know, I had capital or resources or the ability to do things, and, like, everybody didn't believe me. They thought I was poor. And, like, now that I actually have nothing, like, no one believes me. They think I'm super rich. <laughs> so it's like, why are people always in the opposite spectrum of life? It's really, really funny. Yeah. So, so I always I like question, if somebody is an investor mm-hmm. or somebody has a lot of capital, mm-hmm. the thing that I always ask is, ask them is, would you invest in Billy? Like, mm-hmm. would you invest in his new venture or would you invest in Firefest 2? And the question that always comes back is, well, I don't know if he's a genuine fraud star or he's just somebody that just fucked up massively, right? And that's what is in everyone's brains, I think. And every every time that they see you do a podcast or see you make a decision, that is the calculation I think is having in everyone's brain and why I think it's really smart you're doing all this press because you're trying to tilt people to the right way. But to really like look at that, look at answer that question, I think you've got to look at your other projects and then that, that is important data, right? So I think one thing that's working for you is the Magnesis card, right? Now, I know that there's been some press out there saying people feel ripped off and whatever, but I actually... Well, press and experiences. Yeah, yeah. from the experiences. Mm-hmm. But I actually anecdotally have spoken to members and they have nothing but good things to say. Mm-hmm. And I think when I read personally, and, and you know, I'm sure there's people with some bad experiences, but I feel like there's bad experiences with almost every company, every startup. I actually don't... Um, I actually don't put too much weight on the Magnesis customer complaints in a way because I think every startup has their issues and the anecdotal evidence that I've had with people who were members are incredibly glowing about it. So I think that's a good data point for you. But do you want to just touch on Magnesis and um, what that experience was like for you and where you think, like it's not operating anymore, right? Uh, no, it's not. So yeah. Magnesis was around for almost three years before fire and for two and a half of those years, I think we like over-delivered 50x to every customer mm. it was like the last four or five months prior to fire when complaints started happening and it was me mismanaging making bad decisions getting attracted by the shiny light of like a fire festival too so mm. certainly made a lot of mistakes there but like i am very confident that for this like first two and a half years like the x number of thousands of people who had magnesis were you know very very happy and getting over delivered with it so the complaints came because your attention was elsewhere and you took your foot off the yeah, pedal i was a little bit with it in the bahamas trying to execute fire two and like mm-hmm. not not there and i think it was due to my inexperience but the brand was largely based on my input right it was like me working with other companies to create interesting offerings like for the customer so if i wasn't doing that the product wasn't as good as it was you know six months prior so mm-hmm. certainly made a lot of mistakes but i don't like my nieces itself i think was like a great value proposition and people, the customers got their money's worth for it for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think on this point, you know, I was talking about this earlier today. It's like, you know, I grew up being told there are good guys and bad guys in the world. And then I go to jail and I realized like that couldn't be further from the truth. And I think maybe two or 3% of the people there were like actually bad people, but everybody else, they got desperate. They didn't have opportunity and did something, you know, somewhere in that spectrum of like stupid to terrible. And so, yeah, I think like life in general is, is more complicated than, uh, 
than we'd like to think it is. It's so true. I Through Rolling Stone, which is another one of the publications that we work on um, in Australia and New Zealand, I got to go to uh, a high maximum security women's prison. And okay. I, spent, um, I went there over a couple of days and spoke to many inmates. And my huge takeaway was that they were absolutely victims of circumstance mm-hmm. that they some of them really had no hope at all they yep. were just born into these situations where how could you not get into trouble so i really understand that can we talk a little bit about solitary confinement absolutely actually, now that we're on absolutely. the topic of jail what the heck was that uh, like no, so, so Sorry, was it was it almost 300 days that you uh spent? yeah 309 days 309 over, over over two stints one was three months one was seven months um the seven month stint, I tried to do a podcast from the jail payphone, which was not a good idea. So, wait, that's what got you into it. Yes, got it. Yeah, and why is that illegal? Um, it wasn't, which I think made it all the more confusing because it's like you oh. didn't really break the rules, but we don't want you doing a podcast, so we're not really sure what to do. So, you're just going to sit here until you figure it out. What oh. got you into solitary for in the first instance? Um, I was trying to do a book, so I had like a USB recording device. Uh, yeah, not a good. That. that was that was actually. And you knew that was wrong, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. that was completely black and white against the rules. Yeah, um, kind of ironic, right? You break the rules and you get three months, and you don't break the rules and you get seven months. It's <laughs> kind of funny how that works. Full of irony. Yeah, not not really sure what the. I don't the, think you were laughing when you were in fucking solitary no, for was, seven months. It was brutal. But, Tell yeah. us about that. What was it like? Uh, what was the worst? Read a book memory? from. Have you heard of the book called Shanaram about the Australian guy? Yeah, we yeah. are watching the show. Watching, I'm watching the show. The show. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, so I read that book in solitary, which is incredible. So. That was <laughs> no, what was the worst bit about solitude? Uh I think just like separation from life. Uh, I remember I came out of solitary confinement and they had like the, a TV with some sports thing on the wall and it's like you're just like staring like like the dopamine hits of like seeing a TV show for 20 minutes were insane. Like that's when you realize your sensory deprivation was so was so bad. It's like a show you would never think twice about watching. It's like you're watching it like this is the coolest thing that's ever happened to you. So wow. that, that was kind of crazy. But yeah, couldn't go outside because of COVID during the time too. So it's like literally in a concrete box for seven months. Did you feel that you were going a little crazy? I think what was scary was you couldn't see other people because you were behind these like concrete doors, but you could hear them. There was like an inch underneath the door and you would hear people like mentally break down. They start banging, they start screaming, they start crying, and it's like, wow, you're literally witnessing people like crossing that threshold of losing their sanity. And that was the scariest part. And, like in some way it was scary, and then in some way it gave you strength too. It's like, okay, like I'm not there yet. But in the other part, it's like, shit, like am I gonna be here long enough where, you know, that guy who I thought was a tough guy just like lost his mind. So that was kind of freaky. Yeah, is that gonna be me? Yeah, exactly that, gonna be me. Like this guy who I thought was tougher than me is now, you know screaming these things that are absolutely like insane so that was really fucking scary did you get close i don't know i don't think so like i guess you never really know when it's gonna hit right mm-hmm. so i don't think i went totally crazy i'm definitely like super paranoid now and i think uh ironically i'm not scared because of the time i broke the rules and went to solitary because like you can mentally understand that it's like i knew this was against the rules and i did it so i'm punished for it like okay like you you know you smile and move about your day i think the second time scared me it's like shit like there is somebody out there who can snap their fingers, and even though I did absolutely nothing against a rule book, it doesn't matter, right? Mm. And like, there's someone out there who has, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but there's someone out there who has the power to put me literally in a cage. Mm. There's rules you don't even know. Exactly. Exist. Like, that's scary. And that, that's what really got me. And you know what's weird is like, everyone talks about, everyone calls Adam Newman a fraudster. Everyone calls him like, I've never met Adam, yeah. I've had nothing to do with WeWork, but I, I recently was speaking to someone who is a big VC and, um, was an early partner of Adam and we were. Okay. Couldn't say more worse things about Adam. Like, it really? was just really viciously against Adam and spent a lot of time with him. And I'm like, well, that guy... Made a ton of money off of it. You know? He failed massively, yeah. like, ruined a lot of shareholder value, definitely lied all the way through that process mm-hmm. and ended up a billionaire. Yeah. You know, um, it's just uh, it's just such a weird fine line where... Yeah, I don't know. Like, explain exactly why you went to jail. Like, what was the actual charge and why did you not end up a billionaire like Adam? Yeah, you know? so I went to jail because I lied to the investors to raise money. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest misconception is that the festival itself was why I went to jail. That's not true. Even if the festival was better than advertised, I still would have gone to jail. The crime was committed like that second when I said, hey, you know, we have X dollars and we don't really have this much money. Give us more. Like, that was the crime. So it wasn't the actual festival itself. Mm. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, so it's like actually really black and white. Like it was, mm. you know. Here's and that's a, maybe the one thing Adam avoided. Did he, he didn't do that. Yeah, and, I'm, and, I'm not sure. Yeah, you know, yeah, what yeah. He did or didn't I do, mean, Adam's yeah. a metaphor for what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like a lot of people do some terrible things and and ruin shareholder value. Yeah. And don't end up in jail they end up richer you know yeah. and so i think that's like it's a really good lesson for mm-hmm. okay tell us actually what is the lesson for founders promoters like what i think lying actually made the chance of fire one lower because i scared away a lot of really smart people at the end like there are people who had the capital who had the expertise who had the talent whatever it was to actually make it work and like wait a second like i'm intrigued but something is not right here and so i actually think that hurt our chances at the end of the day in, in some weird scenario, so. Okay, so the first data point we touched on before was magnesis. Yeah. My, I think my interpretation was pretty similar to what you just said. I feel like you created a really great business and then you just hit some sort of scaling or capacity point. You probably didn't have the right executives underneath you to keep it going without sure. your attention. Poppy and I made that mistake in our business. Um, so I think that was a really good business. I don't. I think that's a good data signal for you. The next data signal to talk about, which I think is a lot more complicated, um, is the Jonathan Taylor lawsuit that's mm-hmm. happening right now. Yeah. So do you want to explain who Jonathan is and, and what the current situation is? Yeah, sure. So uh, a guy I met in jail um, who, when I was I was released to basically a halfway house for four months after jail. So he came to meet me at the halfway house and he was buying me gifts when I was still basically in prison in the halfway house um, with the hopes of working with me formally. And it came to the attention that he had basically lied about himself, uh, the source of his funds and his background. And so basically fired him and removed myself as a friend from him when I found out the truth. Mm. And that's it. I think he filed a lawsuit, but I think he, he, his lawyer dropped off the case. And I don't think the lawsuit's actually real, but he was trying to get his 15 minutes of fame. So, so what's his claim though? Explain it. Um, his claim is that I promised to work with him on like a marketing agency. Mm. And the reality was he was a child predator who lied about that. So mm. it's tough. And I think like in jail, it's hard because a lot of, I was a come up for somebody like him, right? Like he goes, okay, his crime is less bad than mine. So I will misrepresent myself and hopefully like bring him down a little bit and bring myself up. And that was tough in jail to navigate. And there were people like that, but there are also a lot of good people too. So mm. yeah. How did you artist. find out that he was a child predator? Um, I introduced him to a friend of a friend who was a girl and she said something's not right with this guy and she basically hired a like a pi who found the information about him wow so no one yeah. in jail knew no, no his even school all of his up. files were sealed and like you know confidential so no one could see anything wow yeah. it's a really hard situation yeah. for uh, for you because some guy you're meeting spending a lot of time yeah. with seems nice whatever yeah. and then he wants to back you when the whole world seems to be turning their back exactly on you. Like that would be tempting, yeah. Um, and that would you would jump on that. So I, it certainly it was super hard because it's like this guy is being super generous, super nice, and then it got to the point where he was trying to give a little bit too much, and then like right when that happened, introduced him to a friend of a friend, and she calls. He's like, Billy, something's not right. I'm gonna figure this out, and like that's where it all came. Mm. Uh, like this is too easy. I'm not used e- to it being this easy. I'm not used to being too easy. <laughs> the, the telling thing was he tried to he was trying to buy me when I couldn't leave my apartment a sprinter van i'm like dude i don't need a sprinter like i just got to jail like i got people back it's like no no no, billy i insist i buy you the sprinter i'm like all right something's going on here like what's happening that's where it all kind of came out child predator buying a van yeah it it didn't make sense it It didn't make sense but (laughs) yeah it was tough okay so so he gave you a bunch of money for equity in the business and Uh, then no he never actually invested in the business he was just basically buying me gifts or like you know paying various you know groups or people to be around me but yeah, so the, he was I, never an investor in it. I believe company. I yeah. thought the claim, the reporting yeah. was that he gave you money for a third of the company. Uh, new we, company. We verbally agreed that he would be a partner in this marketing agency. It's nothing mm-hmm. to do with fire. It's like a you yeah. know marketing business. And then we found the truth about him and said, "Hey, we're not gonna we're not gonna work with you." Got it. Yeah. Got it. Um, okay, so this yeah. is a challenge you're gonna have, right? Yeah. Because your um, headlines are super quick with you, and people sure. are really quick to judge with you. Anytime you're in a dispute with somebody, they're going to go, well, I'm going to sue you and I'm yeah. going to look like the good guy. Exactly. Fucking And also, what? It's scary. readers are going to think that it's true. Like, there's a well, lot. They're going to think the worst yeah. rather than give you the benefit of the doubt. Sure. And it's hard, right? Because, like, people, yeah, it's prison in that situation where I was vulnerable, right? I am an easy come up, if you will, for someone who's committed a heinous crime, right? So like, that was what I had to navigate, but thankfully I'm, you know, a year and a half removed from jail at this point, maybe a little bit more. So yeah, feels good to finally be a little bit clear, but it's not, not easy. Mm. Um, what do you think, 
you're most scared about with Fire Fest 2? Good question. Hmm. I'm scared of like losing the magic that the chaos of Fire 1 created by I want to say I don't want to say over preparing, but by making it so professional, I don't want to lose that magic that was there for Fire Festival 1. So it can't be so perfect where it's like any other concert and you don't walk away from it saying like, I met someone that changed my life. Like we got to kind of keep that chaos, magic, adventure component behind When you Fire say 2. magic, yeah. what exactly, what part of Fire Fest are you referring to? I think it's like the thrill of doing something that you would never do without Fire. And that like initial idea. That initial idea. Yeah. We have to have part of it being like, you are with three of your friends being like, I would never have done this in my entire life if Fire didn't exist. So I don't, I don't want to lose that by being too professional in the execution. So I think that's kind of the irony of it. Have you ever thought about just hitching a wagon to some startup that's in their series A or series B and saying, I'm the fucking best marketer in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be your CMO. I want you to give me a shitload of equity and we're going to take this thing public and change the world. Mm -hmm. And you'd make a hundred million dollars with that exercise if you exercise executed well. For sure. So do a lot of marketing work now for like early stage venture back brands. And the idea is trying to see like what gets me excited. Um, I think the opportunity with Fire 2, though, is so big. Like, if this is done correctly early next year, that'll be the best platform to springboard off of. So I think it's like buckle down for the next 11 months and then make this really good and go from there. With your idea, you yes. pay back the investors. Mm. The Sorry, you, you pay back the investors and that's kind of it. Mm. And that's the headline. Mm. Billy McFarlane pays back investors and vendors. He's off the hook kind of thing. With Firefest 2, you get that initial vision mm-hmm. that reimagined and actually cemented it happens and the fulfillment of executing like what i've always wanted to do i think like that's cool the money will come if that vision is executed right and either way it's not going to come in six months it's going to take time but i think the excitement and fulfillment of like making fire work is like so fucking cool and that will lead to a lot of opportunities what's going to be the coolest thing about five fest too I just think just being there on the island and like finally seeing 4,000 people there and like the activities too. It's not just a stage. There's going to be fashion, there's sports, you know, there, there's comedy. It's like watching it all come together. I think it'd be really, really cool. Can you give me some indication of the level of talent that will be there? Yeah. Uh, talent th- meaning who's performing or talent meaning who's yeah. attending? Comedy. Yeah. Mm. You know, artists. Mm-hmm. Or, or who's going to be there? So it's not just music, I think it's like as, as much mm-hmm. as I can say. And I think Fire 2 is more about like the experience with music being the backdrop. So it's like, go jump on a small plane with five of your friends and explore a little remote island and then come back and kind of celebrate and talk about it in front of the stage. So it's more about these like daytime adventures with the entertainment aspect being almost like the nightcap that brings it all together. Targeting the same demo, do you see repeat customers in the pre-orders? So our customers from six years ago are now seven, seven years ago are now seven years older. So I think it's that's interesting, right? And yeah. yeah, we're kind of going through that process now. Do we want to target some of the younger generation or stick with the customer from seven years ago who's now aged a little bit and probably has some more resources, but still kind of has that thirst for the experience? So you haven't seen any crossover of Fire Festival 1 attendees that have bought a ticket to Fire Festival 2? Uh, we haven't sold tickets to the Fire Festival 1 attendees. I think there's probably something we can do for them. I'm not sure what that is yet, but I think that age demographic range is interested. I, however, I think the younger people are less snake bitten from Fire. They've heard about the brand, they're intrigued by it, but they didn't experience any like negativity associated with the first one. So interesting for us to think about. When you say you haven't sold it, does that mean that they could attempt to buy, they could like register their interest at history at Fire Festival 2, um, the email, and you might reject them. So usually they'll tell us first, like, hey, by the way, I had a ticket for Fire 1. Like, like what's going on? So, yeah, trying to compile that list. What's your answer? Um, I think the answer, like, the answer is, did you get paid back for Fire Festival 1? And uh, most people were either they charged back or they got refunds. There was, you know, ticket money in various locations. So I think most people in some capacity got money back, but some didn't. And I'd love to get my hands on the actual numbers and see how many people weren't refunded for Fire 1. And if we could do something for them for Fire 2, that'd be great. So who's the ticket? Who was the ticketing company for Fire 1? Uh, I don't know if I want to talk about them. On a, okay, a fair enough. But yeah, it's, but, I'm sure it's public. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. And um, and you've changed ticketing p- platform for 2, right? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have a ticketing 
platform sponsor for Fire 2. Correct. This is where you have to make a disclosure, Luke. Well, maybe. Who, who is it? Who's the ticketing company? <laughs> Can't say yet. Oh, maybe I can't say the disclosure oh, okay. there. <laughs> I think well, I'm an investor in the new ticket. It's on the website. Using. Posh is on the website. Are you using Posh? Uh, they did our pre-sale, but they we're, we're using somebody else. for. They're absolutely amazing. Like, yeah. I think they're going to be a very, very successful company, but we're using a different platform for like the actual you know, Fire 2 tickets. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm an investor in Posh. I got nice. excited when I saw somebody great, get a ticket. Great, great investment, I think. Like, yeah, I really, really believe in them. That, and that's how we met, right? I was talking to one of your friends and okay. he showed me that he was going to Fire Fest 2 and I saw the Posh ticket. Yeah. I was like, holy shit, I'm an investor in that company. They're and incredible. That's, that's where we ended up. That's how we ended up here. I think that's a great investment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, are you going to be making cheese sandwiches at the festival? We have, we have to, right? <laughs> we absolutely have to. Yeah, but are you personally going to be making cheese sandwiches? I think I have to. But the problem is we want to make the cheese sandwiches good, and I don't even know how to cook cereal. I'm like the worst, I'm like the worst well, cook. Well, the, so. the error there is saying cook cereal. <laughs> exactly. That's not a thing. I know, it's a problem. So we kind of have like an issue there where they got to be good, but I can't make them good. So I'm, but I have to cook them uh, also. We need to see you with an apron making sandwiches, yeah, man. At least to like hand them out or something. <laughs> yeah. Give me like an easier task. Yeah. <laughs> Give me some Easter eggs. So you're definitely cooking cheese sandwiches. Definitely cooking cheese sandwiches. Yeah. Is Jar Rule going to be involved at all? No. Okay. What What happened with you and Jar Rule? Uh, I think it's hard, right? Because like whether it's him or anybody else, I was ultimately the one who was responsible for for Fire One. But I kind of feel like there are certain things that are best in the past, and like new new experts are on the table really helpful for fire two i do think it'd be funny to have 50 cent and fire two just to- <laughs> holy shit for some irony he's not he's not a partner in the festival but I, I do think it'd be funny if he performed at fire two so let's make that happen <laughs> it's so good on so many levels especially fire two succeeds like he at 50 cents the one that made it work that it's is just so like it's funny. almost like that was a plan from the whole from the entire time <laughs> Was Ja Rule an executive? Like, what was his actual role in Five Fest One? Uh, we were partners, so yeah, we were equity partners at least. He just covered his butt a little better legally. I think I, I committed the crime for sure. I, I was I was ultimately the one with the final say because you were the one also doing the pitch meetings and doing the disclosures. Yeah, I think I was like I was the the, the buck stopped with me. I think it's pretty clear. So I was okay. I was ultimately responsible. But yeah. Okay, so and he has no equity in the new Fire Fest. Uh, no. All right. Yeah. You know, like I, when I was, um, when we started the Bragg Media, Poppy and mm-hmm. I, when we had one investor and he put, you know, for an Australian media business, a million dollars is a lot of money. We got a million dollars to it. We fucked it. We mm-hmm. completely fucked it up. It spent, we spent it in eight months and almost didn't have the business. The business hadn't even started yet. Sure. We, had no, we had, had no goals where we were. And then I took, I took a plan back to the investor and co-founder and I said, all right, here's what you're going to do. Here's how you're going to get your money back. Like, we, we're just going to bought plan and just run it super lean and yeah. just draw as much profit out as possible. He goes, oh, well, what are you going to do then? I'm like, I don't know. I'll go get a fucking job. I don't know. Yeah. And he goes, oh, so I just spent a million dollars on you and you're going to go and give that learning to somebody else. And he's like, fuck you. And he doubled down and then we ended up making the business work. Amazing. This is, I mean, I don't know what the personal relationship is with Ja Rule, but mm-hmm. this is what I'm thinking. Like, he just fucking ruined his brand. He backed you he did all he ate shit and now you're gonna go and make it work and he's not gonna be a part of it like surely he's like what's in his brain is he like fuck like i just can't i'm too got too much trauma but then he might miss out on all the upside if it works yeah <laughs> understand where you're coming from i think yeah uh, the the interest of my partners and i, I think lies elsewhere too so yeah we're mm. we're, we're excited about are our... you saying it's your decision not his uh I don't know. There, there's been no there's been no offers made to him, and and, and there won't be. So we, yeah. we kind of have a creative direction that we think is is funny, but also going to be successful that we're going to sprint towards. All right, uh, fifty yeah. cents. Something <laughs> leaving in the past. But yeah, but fifty cents should perform for, for fun at, at the festival. I think that'd be great. Let's make it happen. Um, do you have a Broadway musical coming? Uh, there is a group making a Broadway musical. I think they are fucking hilarious and amazing at their jobs. So uh, I'm very excited for that. I think it's like if it goes well, right? It's like. 10 fire festivals a week or however many shows a week they do. So I think it's yeah. like a really cool way to, you know, open it up to the world and, and, and do it regularly. And you got Are you a, involved in it? Uh, I mean, they're, they're in charge. So hopefully they'll let me mess up some aspects of it or, you know, show up and have some fun. But yeah, they're, I'm excited for how they're going to tell the story. I think they'll probably tell the most accurate representation of what happened, but also make it fucking hilarious. Have you met who's going to play you? Um, I have not met who's going to play me, but obviously I've been spending time with people who are producing it. Oh, cool. Do you get a say in who will play you? I don't think so. I think it's up to them. But yeah. Hopefully. So you got a piece in it, right? 
Uh, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> I hope so. We, I just interviewed on the Variety Australia podcast, I just interviewed Tim Minchin, who did Matilda. Okay. Um, and he was explaining the economics of how you get paid by Broadway, and yep. it's fucking good. Even yeah. though you get pennies every play when it takes off. It really works. It's like a venture mate. capital kind of investment, right? Like most fail, but if it mm. works, it works. So. Mm. One in ten, apparently. When, yeah. When's that going to be ready? Uh, I'm not sure. So this is totally on them. I'm not involved in the day-to-day at all. But uh, hopefully they announce it this year. I think that'd be cool. What do you want to tell people who are thinking about Billy McFarlane? Yep. It's kind of bad, but at this point, I'm just like so jaded by all the shit that I've got like, eaten for the past seven years. And just like, I'm excited for, for next year, right? And like next winter, just to actually do it. And yeah, so at this point, it's like, I guess, watch and see, right? And we're either going to crash or we're going to land. And either way, it's going to be fiery and spectacular. So, <laughs> so, so g- 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 get a seat and, like, and watch what's going to happen. Please don't crash and land in jail again. I hope not. <laughs> that would kind of suck, right? <laughs> and, you're, and, and I guess, what is the thing that you're most proud of in your past across all your ventures? Like, what do you think is going to set you see yourself up over the next 10 years? I think I've made moments in people's lives that they'll never forget. Uh, and like, this is a really small example, but I've met three couples recently who met at Fire One and got married, like from oh, Fire Festival great. One. And like, that's cool, right? Like amidst all the bad stuff happening, those people obviously had life-changing moments. But I think whether it was through Magnesis, through the early days of Fire, I've impacted people's lives in a way that they still like kind of talk about as like that legendary moment. And if I can do that at scale, I think it's really fucking cool. You know what? Nothing tells you more about a potential partner is putting them in a crisis and just seeing how they crawl their way out of it. For sure. So yeah. to be an attendee at Firefest One and seeing someone who you're slightly interested in just yeah. handle it with grace, compassion, and leadership. I mean, hottest thing ever. I get hottest it. thing ever. I get it. <laughs> if, if you got married because of Fire One, I don't know you, please DM me. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to get a list of all these Let's people. Let's get some good stories. Yeah, please. <laughs> So I feel like it's really interesting talking to you now that you've you've almost worked out a way to scale your real core skill set. Mm-hmm. You could be one of the best marketers in the mm-hmm. world, right? So you're taking the CMO slash creative direction role at Firefest. You're running a marketing agency, you know, and I feel like you could do maybe 10 of these kind of things, yeah. right? And so if you think yourself is like, hey, not everything's going to work, but I, if I do enough of it and I'm this good at it, something's going to work sure. and it's going to hit big when it hits. So have you done all this stuff on a whiteboard and go, if I you know, do this many bets and I make this much money from this many bets with my time and all this, like I'm going to pay this money back in no time. Like, Have you done the maths on all of that? Absolutely. I think it's kind of the awkward situation where coming out of jail is it's a slow start, right? You're not like getting off the races and sprinting at full speed. It, it took probably six months to get any kind of like real income coming in to get real people around the table. And now like we're finally there. So now it's time to go, but it just takes a second to kind of get back to reality. Also mentally recalibrating as well. For sure. Yeah. Didn't you have a partner who you started dating Mm -hmm. pre jail and you're still. Yeah. It was on and off for a bit, but yeah, Yeah. but yeah, yeah, she's amazing. But yeah, crazy. Amazing. Crazy. That would have been incredibly tough yeah um but then just adjusting to that world outside of jail across the board would be amazing. it takes time too i think like, like inside i'm like all right i'm gonna walk out and then everybody's gonna call me right away and like in reality you know four people out of the hundred you know picked up my phone call the first day so it just took a while to to get back to it are you forgiving of that oh for sure i, I get it i think people the, the also the biggest thing i've learned about life from jail too is i used to take rejection personally prior to fire failing like they didn't want to invest or they didn't want to date me or they didn't want to work with me it's like oh like what am i doing wrong but i think in general people say no because of their own fears or paranoia or situation it's very rarely because of you i think most people aren't able to put themselves in your shoes and everything is based on them and yeah i, I learned that throughout jail so i get like if someone doesn't want to work with me that day one at a prison it's because they were scared of like hey i don't want to go to jail too and like however irrational it may, may be it's out of their own self-protection mm. When 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 can we buy tickets to Firefest? Uh, later this spring, we'll make the announcement. And where's the announcement going to be? Your socials. Uh, we have a really funny announcement. So I don't want to. I don't want to ruin it. I don't want to ruin it. Now. It's not another selfie video. It's not a selfie video. Okay. No, it's 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 worse than that, but in a funny way. Is it like the commercial, but a parody of the commercial? Close, but I think it's slightly funnier. But yes, Great. it's definitely a parody of it. <laughs> okay. And how are you, uh, short of, okay, so if you think about Austin South By, right? Yeah. They mm-hmm. market it through their channels, that's mm-hmm. all cool. But then they also have 
country representatives in every country. Mm-hmm. Like you've got a guy in Australia who's out there spreading the gospel, yeah. trying to get people to sign up, and he's on some sort of affiliate deal. And I think they have that all over the world. Got and that's how you get the whole world flying to Austin. Do you have a similar idea like that with localized champions in every market, or is there just you don't need to sell that many tickets? It's like, four thousand tickets. I yeah, don't know. It's, it's so small in terms of the actual number of people. Um, I'm I'm sure we don't want everybody just to be from like America and Western Europe, right? We do want to have international representation, so we will have a plan there. But at the end of the day, four thousand people is just not that many. If mm. most people are going in groups of like four, let's say average group size, it's only a mm. thousand groups, so it's still pretty small audience size although the price point when you get to the million is expensive plus, yeah maybe you do need to go into international for sure mm. but there are there will most likely be like a live streaming component of it too so that's probably more of like a worldwide marketing Ooh. component of it yeah billy thank you so much for yeah, coming on this is uh we've done probably a 50 to 100 episodes of the music network podcast i think i was looking forward to this one the most of all of them i've done amazing so i'm really grateful for you coming on and sharing your story thank you thank it's you guys so See you guys next winter, right? <laughs> I'm going. Are we invited? Yeah, of course Let's you're invited. Go. Can't wait, mate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you.